Hello again, everyone. This is going to be our fourth chapter, and this is going to be on energy. This is a continuation of the previous chapter. So if you recall, in the previous chapter, we talked about how our cells convert glucose and fat into ATP. Does that sound familiar? Let's see if I can get this pen to work here. Do we want fountain pen or let's do, let's do fountain pen. Okay, I'm trying to get this thing to work. All right, red, okay. So last chapter, we talked about how we turn glucose and fat, how our cells, muscle cells included, turn those two into ATP because that's the usable energy source, remember? So we're going to continue our topic of energy, but we're going to be talking about it in a little bit of a different way. Okay, so here we go. Here's our outline. My plan is to split this into two, split this lecture into two halves. Why don't we jump right in? Okay, so we already talked about this. For our muscles to work, they need a, I think I like, hold on here. I'm still trying to figure out this new program and I apologize. Technology is supposed to make things easier, but not always. We talked about in order for our muscle cells to be able to move, they need energy in the form of ATP because that's like the fuel source, just like a car. If a car is gonna go, it needs fuel. If you're asking your muscles and your cells to do stuff, they need fuel, right? And that's even more important for athletes. Even though someone who's not doing anything, their organs still need energy, uh, it's even more important for athletes. We know that. Okay. We talked about this last time. How, does our, how do our muscle cells get energy? We eat something, and that glucose or fat is converted into ATP, which is the usable fuel source for our muscle cells. And I know I keep beating this like a dead horse, but if our cells did not have fuel, if we didn't bring in nutrients to then convert into ATP, uh, they would die. Okay, so as I've been saying, uh, this chapter is a little bit focused on different parts of energy, but stay with me because you're gonna know, um, you're gonna be able to identify all that you need to know. Make sure you can define energy and make sure you can define energy expenditure. Energy, whether it's in our body or whether it's in the real world, energy is the ability or the capacity to do work. Keep it simple, energy, the capacity to do work. With energy, you can do something with it. It can be mechanical energy, I can make a car go as in a car engine. It can be radiant energy, I can use a solar power to, to make something do something. It could be chemical or thermal, but the capacity to do work. Energy expenditure is how much energy expended per unit of time. So that's the key here. We know what energy is, the capacity to do work. When we talk about energy expenditure, we can quantify it. What was our energy expended over one hour? What was our energy expended by the muscles in order to run one mile? Which, let's say, it takes you seven minutes, right? So energy is the capacity to do work. Energy expenditure is the work that we do or energy we expend per unit of time. And we can measure energy expenditure in kilojoules. But here in the United States, we tend to use kilocalories or kcals. For example, on average, we know that to run or walk one mile, the body must expend about 100 kilocalories. Okay, so that's energy expenditure, energy expended per unit of time. To run or walk a mile, it takes about 100 kilocalories. Let's define calorie. Um, joule, so we just talked about kilojoule, that's the, the standard metric unit. Um, we are not going to be do that. We're not going to be using that. 
But we're going to use the more English unit because we're Americans, and that would be calorie. And we're going to use calorie and kilocalorie interchangeably. So for our purposes, they mean the same thing. As you can see, technically, they mean something a little bit different, um, but we're not going to worry about that. For our purposes, we're going to use calorie and kilocalorie interchangeably. So what is a calorie? Okay, make sure, number one, that you could identify the formal definition. So on our exams this semester, they'll be mostly multiple choice or true-false. So if I were to give you a multiple choice question, what is the definition of a calorie? You would pick the one that said, quantity of heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius. So know the technical definition. But there's also a simpler definition, and it's really a unit of heat. So the more specific definition is the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius. Well, we can more simply say it's a unit of heat. Okay, so know both of those. All right, um, before we go on, Let's put it all together. Let me change the color. Let's go to white. Okay. If we think about food, bear with me here. We eat food. Yummy. Right into the mouth. The food contains calories. So we ingest this food that contains calories. And what those ingested calories are is heat. So if a Big Mac has about 560 calories, it means that that Big Mac, once we ingest it, has 563 calories or 563 units of heat. So something that has more calories, a food item that has more calories has more heat. What does our body do with that heat? So we bring in the food, it's a form of heat to our body what does our body do with that heat? Our body uses this heat for energy. Because heat is one form of energy or the capacity to do work. All right, so when we eat food and food contains calories, what is it our body is going to do with that heat? Because that's what calories are, units of heat. So we ingest food that is a certain number, a certain un number of units of heat, and our body uses that heat for energy. That's why food can give us energy. All right, good. Um, now in this process, let me change colors again. I know I keep moving around. So let's do yellow. This process of converting food into energy. Right, so the energy expenditure, the process of converting that food that we ingest, which contains calories, which go into our body, to be used as energy. This whole process is not as efficient as you might think. On average, this process of converting calories into energy in our body is about 20 to 40 percent efficient and you're going to see that on the, on, on the next slide anyway you should know this range when our body converts that the calories from food into energy we're able to keep about 20 to 40 percent of that energy the rest of the energy is lost as heat. So if we can convert 20 to 40% of that energy into actual movement or power, the remaining 60 to 80% is lost as heat. And that's just the way it is, folks. You may think that that's terrible, but actually, our body is pretty good at it. Let's think about a man-made machine or a woman-made machine. 
Ha ha. Like a car. A car has an engine and its job is to produce energy to rotate the wheels and get the car to go. Well, the process of producing that energy, we have to release some of the energy along the way as heat. You know, when an engine works, it gets hot because the process of producing that energy, in addition to releasing energy, also releases heat. And we have to put things in the car like the radiator, etc., to be able to get rid of that heat. The same way it works for our body. When we ask our muscles to work, doesn't it create more body heat? Don't you sweat? Yes, of course. So we lose the rest as heat. This number may not sound great to you, but it's pretty good. Man-made machines, like a car, maybe only can recapture 15% of the energy. And 85% of the energy is lost as heat. So it may not sound good, but our body is better than most man-made machines. Okay, so as I said, all you had to know that in the process of converting the calories from food into energy for our muscles, we're only able to capture about 20 to 40% of that as energy for the muscles. The rest is lost as heat. Let me say that again because it's really important. In our body, in the process of converting the calories from food into energy for our muscles, in that process of converting the calories from food into energy for the muscles, we can only keep about 20 to 40% of that energy. The rest of the energy is lost as heat. But that's still pretty darn good, better than most man-made machines. You can quantify this, how efficient we are, but you don't have to know these, okay? That's extra information if you like, but you don't have to know it for the test. Now, what about efficiency in an athlete, Lance Armstrong, who if you re- saw the recent ESPN documentary, I don't know, in my opinion, a big bully. Not only did he dope, they all doped back then, but he bullied other people and sued them. and Not a very nice guy, in my opinion. How might this efficiency yield differ between an athlete and a sedentary person? Average Joe. Well, with exercise training, you can improve that yield. So for the same energy expenditure, an athlete, say Lance Armstrong, he's able to capture 45% of that energy, whereas the average Joe who's sedentary can only capture 20% of that energy. So remember, in our body, we can capture about 20 to 40% of that energy of producing the calories from the heat to, to energy for your muscles. If you're more active and trained, you're gonna be on the higher end of that, another training adaptation. You don't have to know these specific numbers of Lance versus average Joe, but you should know the principle With exercise training, we can improve our energy efficiency. We can improve the energy that we're able to capture. That's pretty cool. All right, let's talk about measurement of energy. Okay, there's the Big Mac. We are gonna talk about two different things. So we can measure, we can measure energy into the body. In other words, food. And that's what we're going to talk about first. We can measure the amount of calories or the amount of heat in food items, like a Big Mac. But we can also measure energy out of the body. In other words, we can measure calories burned. 
How many calories do you burn running a mile? How many calories do you burn doing X, Y, or Z? So we can measure amount of calories, amount of energy. We can measure energy in, and we bring in heat and calories through food, and we can measure energy out. Let's first talk about how we measure energy in. There's the Big Mac. Not that she would eat that, though. Good. Okay, so how do we measure the energy content of foods? Pretty good question. I mean, how do, how do we know that a Big Mac has 563 calories? How do we know that? We know that through a process called calorimetry. And this actually, it shouldn't be direct. I made a typo. It should be indirect calorimetry. So the way in which we measure how many calories food contains is through a technique called indirect calorimetry. And we have two ways to measure heat content of food through indirect calorimetry. We can do a bomb calorimeter and we can do a homemade calorimeter. Let's talk about the bomb calorimeter. Now what's cool is that later on in this course, we have a lab where we use the bomb calorimeter and we make a homemade calorimeter. So we have a lab where we see this process right before your very eyes. Okay, so how do we measure how many calories is in a food sample? The bomb calorimeter is the best way to do it. This is an example of indirect calorimetry. It's a big box, okay? And inside this sealed container, the sealed box, I'm trying to estimate what the size of it is. It's like the size of a little mini fridge, like the smallest mini fridge that they have. That's probably the size of it. So it's a sealed container. And inside that box, we have another sealed container. Okay, and inside that sealed container, we have the food sample. Okay, so we have an inner sealed container that holds our food sample. And it is surrounded by water. You can see that. And what we do, we have a thermometer going down into the water. We take an initial temperature we have an initial temperature of the water, and then we blow up the food, hence the name bomb calorimeter. There's ignition coils. Then we burn the food. You press a button on the unit and it ignites the food. And as that food literally burns, it's gonna give off heat, isn't it? When that food is done burning, we take the temperature of the surrounding water again. And we can see how much the temperature of the water went up. And we can put these values into an equation and we can estimate the heat content or number of calories in that food. We have a whole lab about it later. For now, understand the basics of a bomb calorimeter. It's a piece of um, machinery, however you want to say it, used to measure how many calories are in a food. It's a big box, and inside of it is a sealed chamber, and that sealed chamber holds our food. Surrounding that sealed chamber is water. So we take an initial temperature reading of that water, then we blow up the food, and the food gives off heat, and then we take the temperature of the water again, and we're able to see, based off of how much the temperature of the water went up, we can estimate how much heat the food gave off. And therefore, how many calories that food, that piece of food has. Why is this called indirect calorimetry? Because we're indirectly measuring the heat coming off that food. It's an indirect measurement because we're measuring the temperature of the water. We're not, we're not able to really do a good job of capturing the heat just coming off the food into the air. Water is a much better conductor. So that's why it's called indirect calorimetry, because we're measuring the amount of heat coming off the food indirectly. 
because we're measuring the temperature of the water surrounding it. Pretty cool. Uh, on the left here is the bomb calorimeter that we have in lab. Goes for about $10,000. Here's that inner sealed chamber that we'll put our food sample in and there's water surrounding it. This is the homemade calorimeter. We're also gonna make it in lab later. So even if you don't have $10,000, to go out and purchase your own bomb calorimeter. We're gonna make a version at home. Obviously not gonna be as accurate, but still gonna give us the idea. So much fun. Okay, so what are the important points? If a food has a lot of calories, it gives off more heat. So high calorie foods, give off more heat. A low calorie food gives off less heat. Simple relationship there, but I wanna make sure we understand. Now, different macronutrients can give off different amounts of heat. So if we look at lipids versus carbohydrates and proteins, because we can use all three of these for energy in our body, you need to know these numbers. Lipids give us the greatest energy yield. They give us the best amount of heat. So one gram of, li of lipids yields nine kilocalories of energy. Whereas one gram of carb or protein yields four kilocalories of energy. So overall, we know that higher calorie foods give our body more heat, lower calorie foods give us less heat. We can look a little bit more specifically at the macronutrients, lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins. When we ingest these foods, they give off more or less heat. Lipids give off the most heat. Check that out. For one gram of liquid, we can get a yield of nine kilocalories of energy versus carbs and protein, which can give us an energy yield of four kilocalories per gram. Fat gives us almost double the energy. So our muscles like to burn fat because it gives us twice the energy, over twice the energy. But we can't burn fat right away because fat takes too damn long. Fat there's more steps involved in breaking down fat and burning it, it's a pain in the butt. So even though our muscles would like to burn fat all the time, it's not possible because we need to be able to burn something first while we're trying to get to the fat. So it's the best of both worlds, ladies and gentlemen. We can burn carbohydrates first for quick energy. It doesn't give us as much energy per gram, but it gives us something. And then when we exercise for a longer duration, it gives us enough time to complete all the steps to burn fat for energy. Oh man, I'm excited. Here's some actual examples. The numbers of um, four and eight are actually, excuse me, four and nine. What am I talking about? The numbers of four and nine are actually averages. If you wanted to know exactly how many kilocalories per gram you get from animal food versus eggs, you can look it up here. This is just for reference, you don't need to know it. All right, these are some questions that you can use to think about, okay? I'm not gonna go through them now, but if you have questions, email me, send me a remind message, come ask me on a Zoom office hour, but you should know these numbers. Per one gram, carbs and protein give us about four kilocalories of energy, but fat gives us nine kilocalories per gram. Okay, so we've talked about measuring energy in 
In other words, how many calories are in food? Now let's talk about measuring energy out. Or measuring, how do we measure how many calories our body expends? Now, we're also going to use an indirect method. Theoretically, I guess you could do a direct measurement, but it's really difficult. This will be an example of a direct measurement, but you'd have to have, like literally, you'd have to have a special room where you're able to measure the amount of heat coming off someone directly, um, but it's hard. So anybody that I know, and I've got a doctorate in exercise physiology, anytime that we measure energy expenditure, it's through indirect calorimetry. Okay, so how do we do it? If you think about how we measured how many calories were in a food item, we measured the temperature change of the water surrounding that food item as it burned. Now we're going to do something completely different. When it comes to measuring energy expenditure for a human, we can actually use gas exchange. All of the rest of the information on this slide is true, um, but it's extra. It's kind of getting into the weeds a little bit. But I just want to introduce this to you. It may not seem like it's going to make sense. You know, how can we estimate how many calories our muscles are burning through gas exchange? But we can. So instead of using, as we did for the food, we used water temperature change of the water as a proxy, here we're able to use gas exchange. And the most common way we do it is using spirometry. We have someone on a treadmill or an exercise bike, and they have a respiratory apparatus on. I think it's going to be a picture. Yeah. Like here's a good picture of what a respiratory apparatus would look like. So you have someone doing an exercise and they have this respiratory apparatus on them. And what we can do is, is we're able to measure exactly how much oxygen they breathe in and we're able to measure exactly how much carbon dioxide they breathe out. Okay, and these tubes go to a little computer. Okay, so you can see down below here, this is a metabolic cart. This is what all these tubes are going to be going to. So you, we have these respiratory tubes, right? And these respiratory tubes are going to go into the computer, which is going to analyze it. But keep it simple, folks we're able to estimate how many calories the body burns through gases because we can directly measure the amount of oxygen we breathe in and the amount of CO2 we breathe out. We plug those numbers into some formulas and we can estimate energy expenditure. There's other ways to measure energy expenditure. What I just described, measuring the gases, is called spirometry. This is the most accurate. By the way, at Hudson Valley Community College, we have a metabolic heart. We have this exact equipment. I don't know, it costs about $30,000. We have it. We could put someone on a treadmill. And in this lab, that's what we do. We put this resp respiratory apparatus on them, <clears throat> do some calculations, and we can estimate how many calories they burn. It's really cool. This is the most accurate spirometry through measuring gases. There's another way that you could estimate energy expenditure, and that's through something called accelerometry. I mean, now even the iPhones have, or excuse me, the iWatches. If you have an iWatch, you're able to estimate how many calories you burn, and they do it through a computer chip that serves as an accelerometer. It used to be that we would put them on someone's ankle, 
it looks like this up close, but it measures your position and acceleration in space. So if you move in a certain direction and with a certain acceleration, we can estimate how many calories you burn. Not as accurate, not as accurate as the spirometry. There used to be a fuel belt you could get with Nike. This is a couple years old. I used to tell people, don't spend money on the fuel belt with the accelerometer when you can buy one for $40, $41. Um, but really now, I mean, the eye, the eye watches have an estimate, but definitely not as accurate as the spirometry. Uh, they can also use accelerometers to measure trauma, for example, concussions in football, uh, but don't worry about that. This gives you some of the statistics about the accelerometer, accelerometry, and how accurate it is or isn't. You don't need to know these numbers. And yet there's even some other ways you could do it by heart rate, measuring heart rate, um, some other things, but don't worry about these. The only ways that we talked about measuring how many calories we expend is through spirometry, which is the measuring the gases in and out through the respiratory mask, and then accelerometry, putting a little computer chip in something that measures our acceleration and positional changes. Spirometer is much more accurate. Okay, um, what do these numbers mean? So we just spent all this time talking about spirometry. So let's talk more about spirometry. Because putting that respiratory apparatus and measuring amount of oxygen breathed in and measuring the amount of carbon dioxide breathed out, that gives us a lot of information. And one of the things that that information can give us is something called the respiratory quotient and respiratory exchange ratio. So again, and I'm a terrible drawer, folks. Let's see, eye, nose, mouth, chin. Here's a dude exercising, right? <laughs> a really bad draw. And we have that respiratory mask on this person, and we're able to measure exactly the volume of oxygen brought in. And through a separate tube, we're able to measure exactly the amount of carbon dioxide breathed out. So what values is that giving us? That's giving us the volume of carbon dioxide brought in. And if we divide that by the volume of, excuse me, I think volume of carbon dioxide breathed out. I may have said breathed in. But we can take the volume of carbon dioxide breathed out and we can divide it by the volume of oxygen breathed in. This is our respiratory exchange ratio. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's a ratio, one number over another, and it's the respiratory exchange. How much we breathe in, VO2, on the denominator, and how much we breathe out, VCO2, as, as a numerator. And again, all that V means is we're just quantifying it. So per minute, we can get a quantity of volume VO2, volume of oxygen brought in per minute, and we can get the VCO2, volume of carbon dioxide breathed out per minute. If we do the math, if we take our VCO2 and divide it into the VO2, that gives us a number and that number is the respiratory quotient. Because quotient is what you get when you divide something by something else. We tend to use these terms interchangeably because the RER leads to the RQ, right? Um, but this is technically the difference. Oh, and we're not done, folks, because what does that RQ tell us? So here's what I just said, right? We take the VCO2 and divide it by the VO2. And that's going to give us the RQ, okay? 
That tells us substrate utilization. And we'll talk about what that actually means right now. That number, when I divide the volume of carbon dioxide per minute breathed out, and I divide that by the volume of oxygen per minute brought in, whatever that number is, let's say it's 1.0. What if I breathe in and out the same volume? That tells me something. That tells us what nutrient our muscles are using for energy. The fancy term for this is substrate utilization. What substrate or what nutrient are our muscles utilizing for energy? So when we get that RQ, for example, an RQ of 1.0 tells us that our muscles are burning 100% carbohydrates. Isn't this phenomenal? Just by these gas exchange numbers, not only can we estimate how many calories someone burns, but we can also, not only can we tell how many calories somebody burns, but we can also determine what nutrients our muscles are burning for energy. If that RQ is 1.0, the muscles are burning 100% carbs. If that ratio is 0.85, then we're burning a 50-50 carb-fat mixture. And if that RQ is 0.7, we know our muscles are burning all lipids. You should know these numbers. Don't worry about protein because it's not often that we use a lot of protein for energy. You know this already because I've drilled it into your head. Instead, our protein in our body is used much more for structure of muscles and hair and nails and ligaments and tendons and our protein is used to form important chemicals not so much for energy. Excellent, so these gases, this gas data that we can get through spirometry, which is a form of indirect calorimetry, measuring the amount of gas we breathe in and out during exercise gives us so much information. It can tell us how many calories we expend, how many calories we burn doing an activity, but it can also tell us at a given point in time what, mus what nutrients our muscles are burning for energy. That's really cool. Here's the rationale for how. You don't need to know this specifically, but the chemical composition of these gases varies on what our muscles are burning for energy. So that's why we can tell the difference. But don't worry about these specifics. Okay. Before we end this first half of the video, I just want to bring a point home. Like I said, at an RQ of 1.0, when our volume of CO2 produced and our volume of oxygen brought in are the same, and our RQ is one, our muscles are burning 100% carbohydrates. You're more likely to burn 100% carbohydrates at the onset of activity, right? Carbohydrates are what our muscles go to first. So our RQ is gonna be highest at the onset of activity or the beginning of activity. When we exercise for a longer period of time, we're gonna to get to be able to use more fat. So as the duration of activity increases, that's when our RQ is likely to be closer to 0.85. You should know this. At the onset of activity, or if we have a quick increase in intensity and we need quick energy, what is it our muscles go to first? Carbs. So they will burn carbs and our RQ will show to be close to one, if not right at one. But as we exercise for a longer duration, we start to burn more fat, the RQ will go down and be closer to 0.85. But of course, this is a spectrum. 
At first, it's always going to go in this direction. At first, we always burn carbs and then we get into fats. Therefore, when we, 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 when we begin exercise, the RQ is always going to be one. And as we continue exercise, the RQ will go down. But during the course of an exercise session, after we initially go in that direction, we may backtrack. What if I'm running? I start running, burn some carbs. I keep running. I keep running. I burn some fat. But then I reach a really huge hill, (laughs) uphill. And I've got to increase my intensity to get up that hill. So my muscles are all of a sudden being asked, to contract at higher intensity. Therefore, they're gonna need quick energy. And what's quick energy? Carbs. So for a period of time, I may go back and have a higher RQ. But then when I get back to the top of that hill, I may start to burn more fat again. So ultimately, it becomes a spectrum where we can move through burning carbs and fat. All right, good stuff, everyone. Don't worry about that for now. Here are some more questions if you want to get your thinking cap on. I'm happy to answer them uh, or check your answers through email or Remind or on Zoom. Okay, we're going to pause, and then we'll pick this up for part two.